Well, it's good to be here in Duluth, Minnesota. Uh, well, I guess it's been, I think I was told this morning, 40 months since, since I've been in Minnesota. Last time was in February in Virginia, Minnesota. Uh, my son and I were there at that time. And they, uh, we happened to turn on the weather channel, I think it was at that point, and they said uh, we were 30 miles from the, one of the 10 deadliest places to be, that people that went through this valley died before they got through the other end because of the cold. And I thought... Maybe next time we ought to schedule a different month to come in. So, <clears throat> I, uh, I'm not a cold weather person, so we did it just right. This is great weather. I always tell everybody if the ground is white, it ain't right. So, <clears throat> uh, give me a tropical area anytime. So, all right, well, good morning. Glad to be here. Hope you're going to be glad to be here by the time we get done. First off, we're going to uh, be covering a lot of ground. We've got three days to do it in. We do it normally, so uh, it's, this is what we do. Uh, we've got some testimonies we'll be bringing you. And, uh, but I wanted to share that um, basically uh, I've still got a pastor down in Texas that I see from time to time when I'm not on the road. I'm also pastoring in Texas now. But um, he used to say that the truth shall make you free. But first it will make you mad. So generally that's, if you get mad, just hang on. It gets better. All right? So they don't... <laughs> So, let's, uh, let's go ahead and open up. We'll open with prayer. I always do that for the religious people. <clears throat> Father, we thank you. Lord, we bless you. We bless your name. Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you that you have people here that are your people, that have ears to hear. And Father, we are after truth. We are after the Spirit, the Word of God. And Father, we will not settle for anything less. Lord, we, we completely disregard traditions and, and vain philosophies. And, Lord, we go straight for the truth of your word and the truth that produces freedom for the oppressed. So, in Jesus' name, Father, we thank you. And I say now, we break anything that would try to hinder or interrupt or, or any type of distractions. And, Father, we say we bless you and we thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. We have a... We have a... Um, a manual that we will be working out of. If you want one, you can get one in the next room at, during a break. Now, the way we'll be running this, we'll be running 45-minute sessions, roughly, with about a 10, 15-minute break in between, so you get a chance to get it move around. So uh, let's try to keep the movement down between sessions or during sessions to a minimum, right? And uh, matter of fact, you may see... How many of you have been through a DHT before? You have, nobody? Very few? Nobody? No? Okay. Well, um then you won't be surprised because, uh, if anything, the message is the same, but the uh, methodology is much more militant. So you may like me even less than you did the last time. <laughs> so, but what I have found out is that the more militant I get, the more, um, how can I say, the bolder, I don't want to say wilder because people get pretty wild at times, and not always biblically wild, but um, the bolder we get, the more militant we get, the better it works. And I have found out that Jesus is a warrior. He's not a wimp. All right? And the church has, uh, just as a, as a rule of thumb, usually every group, every organization, will become or take on the characteristics of the majority of the people in that organization. And because of times past, the majority in the church has been women. The church has been feminized. And so we have pictures of Jesus as the weak, wimpy type person that has fasted so much that they can hardly stand up. Uh, he's always carrying a little lamb. He's got his little shepherd's crook and all that kind of stuff. And, and uh, we picture him a certain way. And <clears throat> the Jews pictured him a certain way. And they missed him. Because they saw him coming as a warrior. And he came as a lamb. But the next time he's coming, he's coming as a warrior instead of a lamb. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of the church is still looking for the lamb to return. And he's not going to be a lamb when he returns. He's going to return with a rod of iron. And he is going to rule as a warrior. And so the Bible says that when he returns, we shall be like him. So if we're going to be like him, we're going to be warriors. Simple as that. Uh, in the Exodus, many, many people that have studied healing knows that Exodus 15.26 says that, I am the Lord that healeth thee. But what they don't realize is that in Exodus 15.3... It says the Lord is a warrior. The Lord is a man of war is actually the way one translation says. So one of the things that we have noticed is that 
Jesus' mission was warfare from start to finish. Every healing he performed was war. It was an, act, it was a, an open act of war from the kingdom of God against the kingdom of darkness. And so what we have learned is that the more, like I said, the more militant we get, the more warrior-like we get, uh, the better it works. Now, I have to say this because many people's minds tend to think a certain way when we talk about warriors. But many years ago, I was, uh, trying to think of where I was at, somewhere up in Delaware, I believe it was. And <clears throat> during one of the breaks, if there's usually a baby around, I'm going to end up holding it, playing with it at some point. And there was a, a small infant in that meeting and the parents uh, as they were talking to him I asked if I could hold him and they said sure and so I was holding him and he fell asleep while I was holding him and I had to go back and preach and every time I started laying down he'd start to wake up so I just held him and preached for about 45 minutes walking back and forth and whenever shortly after that I was asking the Lord I said how far do you want me to go with this militant thing you know how how far can I go and the Lord gave me, and I, I'm not one given to a lot of visions and different things like that, but the Lord allowed me to see something in a split second that showed me how He wanted me to be and how He wanted me to present the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that was this, that I was to be a, a warrior with a sword in one hand and yet be tender enough to hold an infant in the other at the same time and be able to wield the sword effectively without crushing the infant. Because if you ever know what warfare is like, you tend to get tense and a lot of things, and it would be real easy to crush a baby. But the Lord said, keep that balance. If you keep the balance of not hurting anybody, of, of being tender enough to hold a baby, but yet being a warrior that can wield the sword effectively, he said, that's the balance you keep. And so since then, we have at times struggled to keep that balance. But I believe you'll hear in the message, I believe you'll hear that balance. Because basically, <clears throat> just to give you some real quick history, and let me make sure i got my clock here so we don't run over too much. <clears throat> a lot of people want to know how we came into the ministry. I'm going to give you a real quick. quick this first session is going to be like an introductory, uh, introductory section. That um, people wonder how we came in contact with it, how it was passed to us, why we have it, and that kind of thing. And there's a lot of different controversy over it. Uh, not on our end, it's just people don't like it. Uh, whenever the ministry was passed to me in 1987 by Wilford Wright, who was John Lake's son-in-law, uh, there was a lot of people that were associated with him at that time that did not like the fact that he passed the ministry to us. And they have, um, some of them have tried to argue with it, but the fact is, <clears throat> the reason he passed it to us was, and, and I'll backtrack a little bit from time to time, but there was a prophecy that Dr. Lake gave in 1934 that actually told about the person who would pick up the ministry and carry it on. And if you've heard any of our meetings or been in our meetings or heard our tapes or any of that kind of thing, you'll know that I do not claim... Dr. Lake's anointing. I don't claim the mantle of Dr. Lake or any of that kind of stuff. I've had other people say it about us and different things. But the funny thing is, usually what people argue about is everybody says, I'm trying to claim Dr. Lake's mantle. Well, I don't, right? So you heard it directly from me. I don't claim <clears throat> Dr. Lake's mantle. Now, uh, the reason I don't claim it is because I don't want it, all right, first off. Secondly, I'm not claiming Dr. Lake's anointing because I don't need it. I have the anointing of Jesus Christ. Right? That's a lot better than any man's anointing. There have been people that have gone to Dr. Lake's house that still exist and <clears throat> have bought it and sold it and walked through it and rubbed the wood and tried to get the anointing that Dr. Lake had while he was there, and which is kind of ridiculous because there was people that lived in that house after him, and who knows what anointing they left behind. Right? So <clears throat> maybe you don't want the anointing of the last people that lived there. I don't know. So... Uh, you're going to hear, I, I do not uh, emphasize a lot of on, on anointings. I emphasize on responsibility. I emphasize on doing what you're supposed to do and setting the captives free. I'm not going <clears> to, <throat> because if what I do is by anointing, then you can't do what I do. But if what I do is by the word of God and by faith in God, then you can do what I can do. All okay, right? Amen. Now, <clears throat> in doing what I do here, when I'm behind the pulpit, I act in a certain office. But everything I'm going to be teaching you what to do and how to do, I do as a believer laying hands on the sick. No office gives you more anointing to do the basics of Christianity. All, right? All anointings do is give you greater responsibility for which you will answer. So you might not want to be as quick to jump on these things and claim anointings. 
right? Because what you claim may be what you're held accountable to. So it may be best sometimes not to claim it and just walk in it, right? I was uh, <clears throat> blessed to have been under Dr. Lester Simwell for several years. And one of the things that he used to tell us is that an apple tree doesn't need a sign or a tag or a label to know that it's an apple tree, that it produces an apple. How do you know an apple tree is an apple tree? It produces apples. And so a lot of people walk around with tags. Uh, I was in Dallas at one time, and a friend of mine came over. It was a Saturday morning, and he said, uh, Curry, come, come go with me. There's this big prophetic conference going on. Come, come go with me. Okay, so we go over. I got on hiking boots and blue jeans and I think a pullover shirt or something like that. Not dressed up to impress, right? And uh, we go to this big meeting and you got people walking around in suits that cost more than my car did. And <clears throat> they're walking around with tags that says prophet so-and-so and apostle so-and-so and all these different things. And this one guy walked up to us and shook our hand and said, hello, I'm prophet so-and-so. What's your name? And I looked at him and I said, well, if you were a real prophet, you could tell me. <laughs> <clears throat> so... My, my friend didn't like that a whole lot. Uh, <laughs> remember him saying, Curry, man, I can't take you anywhere, man. <laughs> but I'm, uh, I'm much more on results than I am tags. Anybody can print up a tag. But the Spirit of God produces results. Amen? So we're not going to be dealing with necessarily what you call anointings. I call responsibility. Simple as that. So we're not going to be... I'm not, Generally, we don't do an impartation service because I can't give you what you've already got. All I'm going to do is show you what you already have. Okay? There's plenty of people out there that will sell you an anointing. All right? I'm not one of those people. So as you say, why are you talking like this at the beginning? Because I want, to give, I want to make sure you don't waste your time. Because we're going to break here in 45 minutes, and if you don't like it, you can leave. All right? Simple as that. Because to be honest with you, I'm looking for people that want to work. I'm looking for people that want to get the Word of God and do it and set people free. Not interested in a, another organization or another, you know, program or, or some. <clears throat> it's amazing how we get so distracted and sidetracked on things that, when it comes down to it, do not amount to a thing. And it ends up all it does is puffing people up, making people think they're saying something or think they are something when they're not. And the Bible is very clear about it. Matter of fact, it says at one point that a man that professes or claims to have a gift or boasts of having a gift that he does not possess. Is like clouds and wind without rain. In other words, you can put on a good show, you can say a whole bunch and cause a big disturbance, but when it comes down to it, the rain produces life. And so a person can say a lot and have all kinds of stuff, but can they produce life? That's what it comes down to. That's, uh, Dr. Lake used to say that the person of God, the man of God, the woman of God, should be able to manifest the Spirit of God at will. Now, a lot of people argue with that. A lot of people want to sit and wait and... You know, I've heard people say, well, we're just going to wait at his feet until he shows up. And i got news for you. He showed up before you did. Right? He got here before you did. He'll be here after you leave. He's got a head start on you. You're not going to get ahead of him. As a matter of fact, there's uh, a lot of things, uh, a lot of these traditions that we have built up that Jesus said. He said that he only gave two reasons for failure. Once, he said, because of your unbelief. The other was, he said that by your traditions, you make the word of God of none effect. That's the only two reasons there is failure. That's it. So everything else, people say, well, you know what, why have I not received my healing? What can stop my healing? It's real simple. The only hindrance to healing is the fact that you believe there are hindrances to healing. That's it. Everything else. Sin in your life, you can get healed. We, we've done it. Uh, if you've got sin in your life, you can minister healing. Now, I know this comes as a shock to some people. But um, basically everything, people say, well, what, what method works best then? The one you believe in. At, uh, remember I told you just a minute ago that I was with Dr. Summerall? And so I got to hear some stories about Smith Wigglesworth. And you've heard some of them about where he punched people. And, and, and you know, we pray for those kind of anointings a lot of times when you're dealing with family. You want to be able to punch people. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't, we don't always get them, but you, know, you can claim them anyway, right? And so... As I was studying anointings, because I'd heard so many people put things over on anointings. You know, well, I'm not anointed for this, or that's not my anointing. And, you know, we have different terminology in the church. Used to we called callings or, or ministry or, or different areas. And whatever buzzword is the current buzzword, that's what we use. And in reality, people talk about Wigglesworth, and we're going to talk about some of these things in more depth later on. But Wigglesworth uh, used to punch people. 
Sometimes he would kick them, you know, different things. He kicked a baby off of a platform one time. And uh, whenever the people caught it, it was perfectly healed. So if you're going to kick babies, it better be healed, okay, by the time it lands. Because uh, I guarantee you, and you better hope it lands healed before I get to you. All right? As simple as that. Cause you don't start hurting babies, okay? And, uh, but people think, well, you know, that's an unusual anointing. No, it wasn't. It was the method that he had faith in. And you say, well, how did you get faith in a method like that? It's because when he was younger, he had appendicitis. And there was a young man and a woman that came to pray for him. And the young man, while they were praying, jumped on the bed he was lying on and punched him in the stomach where his appendix was. And he was instantly healed. And from that time on, when anybody had any type of stomach problems, he would punch them and they'd be healed. It wasn't anointing. It wasn't uh, God didn't whisper in his ear. It was something he had faith in. And so when he punched people, he released his faith, and they got healed. So, now, if you got faith for that, wonderful. If you don't, don't bless God, you punch me, you better, I better be healed when you finish, all right? Because <laughs> I'll punch you back, all right? So, it won't make any, so, so, that's just an example of how we think about things. So, we're going to look at some of these things as we go on. And uh, honestly, I have found out, and, and I, as, we get, as we go on, you'll get to know me a little bit better that, one of the reasons I'm as aggressive as I am is because I've seen too many people die. I've seen too many people sick. And I've seen, and even in my own life, uh, we went to many people uh, to get my daughter healed. And I had a, and I'll tell you the story a little bit more in depth a little bit later on. But I had a daughter that died when she was three. And all of the people that were teaching me faith at the time, the best in the world, teaching faith, teaching healing, all these things, I couldn't get a hold of one of them on the phone. They were all too busy or too important. And I wasn't writing a big enough check or something along those lines. And so I couldn't get to anybody, and she died, and we buried her three days later. Or actually, we buried her the next day. And uh, so from that time on, uh, like I said, I'd been taught faith. I'd been taught healing. I had been taught the best there was at the time. And it did not work. Uh, We saw some advances. We saw some good things. But overall... It did not work. And so I started studying deeper and uh, started looking. I have a background in martial arts. I'm not in martial arts anymore. God's delivered me from it, delivered me of all devils that I had while I was in it. So if you're in it, you got devils. We can get you free. Just don't practice them. All right? And uh, you can get rid of them. A Christian has no business in martial arts. Uh, We're to turn the other cheek, and that doesn't mean with a good left hook. All right? So you just you, you need to get out of it. But my background was in it. And so, because of that, I had a history of whatever area I wanted to be good in. I would find a person that was good in that area and go study under them. And so, when I wanted to learn kicking, I went to a man named Bill Wallace, who was known for being able to kick at 70 miles an hour, and he taught how to kick. And when I wanted to learn how to use my hands, I went to another man who had the fastest hands in the world. And so, I've had a history of finding the best and studying under them. Well, whenever I started studying healing, I studied the best at what there was. But when it didn't work, then I started doing deeper research and started finding people like Wigglesworth and Dr. Lake and some of the different people. And Wigglesworth was intriguing because of the supernatural manifestations and the variety of things that happened. But he never really reproduced himself. And so as I was studying Dr. Lake, I realized that a person that knows it best is the one that can reproduce himself. And so I started studying Dr. Lake doing everything I could to find out about him. Uh, finally, I found out that he had a, a daughter that was still alive and a son-in-law, and uh, they were actually carrying on the ministry to a degree. So I started making phone calls to track them down and finally found them. And for about the next seven years almost, we had a relationship. And over those years, every Monday I would call their house. I was living in Dallas. They were living up in uh, Kennewick, Washington. And I would call. I had a list of questions. I would ask the questions. He would try to answer them as best as he could. And then I would spend all week going to the Bible and seeing if the answers were biblical. And by the end of the week, I had a whole new set of questions. So the next Monday, I'd call all over again. And so for about seven years, we kept that up. I was running about a $400 a month phone bill, <clears throat> which my wife wasn't happy about. But um, I told her, I said, someday it'll pay off because someday I'll be able to put my hands on the sick and they'll recover. And I said, that'll be worth anything we spend. And so... We did that. We studied. We, uh, I, he gave me a list of names of people that had trained under Dr. Lake. 
that were still living at, the, at that time. I hunted them all down. Many of them I did find in cemeteries. <laughs> there were a lot of them though that were still living. Uh, I, I contacted all of them. I interviewed them, some on videotape, some on audio tape, uh, some over telephone. But I have compiled all of these uh, messages, these different things, that, these interviews. And then uh, actually in 1986, uh, Gertrude, Lake's daughter, passed away in November of 86. And I knew that Wolford wouldn't last much long after that. They were too close. And so by June of 87, he had passed away. But between November of 86 and June of 87, uh, he started shifting everything over to me. Actually, the first thing he did was ask me uh, some of my testimony. And I, I was wondering why he was asking, so I just started sharing. And what had happened was uh, I was born in 1959, April of 1959. In September of 1960, I got hit by a car. My dad didn't see me. He backed out over me, uh, ripped my right ear completely off. You can still see the scar. He ripped the scalp from here all the way across the top of my left ear. All of this was from the front here was pulled down like a mask to my eyes. Uh, the scar, I've still got a, actually like a, almost like a bald spot in here that feels almost like plastic where they put me all back together. It took a little over six hours and 172 stitches. Uh, my head swelled up like a basketball. But whenever, when my dad hit me, he got out of the car and looked. And I was laying under the car. I was not moving. He assumed I was dead. I uh, don't know if I was or not. I honestly can't say. I didn't see a bright light or anything like that. So, And, of course, I was, what, 17 months old, so I probably wouldn't remember anyway. But um, he ran into our house. We were at a family reunion. He ran in telling everybody, I've killed our baby, I've killed our baby. The whole family ran out. My grandfather grabbed me, uh, picked up my body, picked up my ear, put me in his truck, took me to the hospital, and like I said, it took me about six hours and about 172 stitches for him to put me back together. In the meantime, the doctor would come out. The first time he came out and said, uh, it's hopeless, he's going to die, there's no use, uh, just get ready to bury him. My mom went to praying and said, God, he's yours. We dedicate him to you. If you let him live, I'll raise him for you. Then about an hour and a half after that, the doctor came back out. He had to take kind of like shifts. And he said, well, you know, he, he's actually living. But even if he does live, he will be a vegetable all of his life. And there's, there's no hope. There's too much brain damage. And he went back in to do some more surgery. My mom went back to praying and said, God, that's not good enough if you're going to let him live then make him normal. Well, there's still a lot of controversy over whether I'm normal. <laughs> but the ones that call me names also call me when their kids get sick. So it still works out good. Then uh, he went back in and did, did some more work. And after about another hour and a half, came back out and said that I had never lost consciousness during the operation, which was a good sign. And, uh, but he said even if I was normal, that I would never have any hearing in my right ear and I would never have any hair. He was wrong on both counts. Right? So, they, um, after that, my, my parents were very young at that time. My mom did not send me to school right away. Um, she taught me how to read using the King James Bible. Uh, for years, my dad worked nights. He was a policeman. And so, instead of, me, instead of her reading me to sleep, she made me read her to sleep. And that's how she taught me to read. I tell everybody I was seven or eight before I realized that these and thous wasn't normal English. That that was, you know, I thought it was normal. So um, all that time, though, God was putting stuff in me so that years later I knew scriptures that I didn't know I knew and didn't even know they were in there. And so there was a purpose for it. Now that, I was hit. I was hit by the car on September 16th, 1960. And whenever I told Wilford my testimony, I didn't know what day I had been hit by the car because it had never been brought up before. All I knew is I was 17 months old, which put it in September. And he said, well, what day was that? And I said, well, I, I don't know. He said, well, find out. I thought, who cares what day? I mean, it, you know, it happened. I can prove it. You know, we got the medical records. We've got all the stuff. I've even got bandages. My mom still has the bandages. It still has the blood on it. So, I mean, she kept all that stuff. You know, she's a mom, right? So she keeps all the stuff. <laughs> <clears throat> and if you, if you see her, she will whip them out and show them to you, too. I mean, she'll tell you. <laughs> so... <clears throat> along with pictures of me on a blanket. Anyway, so they have, but they, at that time I had to go back to my mom and found out and told her, found out what the day was. It was September 16th. And he said, yeah, I thought so. I thought, thought so. That doesn't make sense. He said, well, there was a prophecy that Dr. Lake gave. 
on uh, May 24th of 1934. And what he said was this. He said that, and, and actually it's in the manual. I believe we included it in the manual. That he said that 25 years from the day of his death. Now, he didn't know what day he was going to die, but he said that was the prophecy that came out. 25 years from the day of his death, Satan would try to take the life of the person that would carry on the ministry. Well, first off, the beginning of that prophecy also said that the person who would pick it up would be born the year the country quit growing. Well, obviously the population is still growing, so it had to mean something else. Well, the last state was added to the Union in 1959. That was the year that I was born. And he said that 25 years from the day of his death... Satan would try to kill that person. Well, Dr. Lake died on September 16th of 1935. 25 years later is September 16th, 1960. And so it all came together. And so Wilfred said, we believe that you're the person. And he, I have some other letters and things that he wrote. And he said, of all the people that had contacted them, that I had pursued how to do the ministry more so than how to get Dr. Lake's anointing. And that I had pursued the essence of the ministry. And he said that also verified some things that Dr. Lake had said. So, um, he passed the ministry to us. He passed us a bunch of uh, letters, documents, uh, photographs, diaries, different things that Dr. Lake had. Uh, some of which we're starting to publish now for the first time. But also, um, he also transferred the ministry to us. Now, at that point, he also gave me a list of names of several people who had worked with Dr. Lake. And like I said, I had interviewed them. And... He gave me the name of some people and back in 1995. Now, from 87 until 95, all during that time, I had told the Lord, until I can carry it with the same power and effectiveness that Dr. Lake did, I'm, not, I'm just going to leave it. Otherwise, it will die. I'll not carry it if I can't carry it with the same results because I'm not going to build up some monument to a man and continually relive or live my life through his adventures. And so I said, uh, you're going to have to produce the Spirit of God in my life, and we're going to have to have the same results, or it'll just die and never be picked back up. Well, in 1995, we went down to uh, Alvin, Texas. And, uh, matter of fact, we went down to uh, see Pauline Parham. You may know who that is, Pauline Parham? Her father-in-law was Charles Parham. He started the Pentecostal movement in 1901. And we went to hear her preach. She was a little bitty woman in Alvin, Texas, just outside Houston. Well, Eventually, I went over to Houston because I knew that there were some people there that Dr. Uh, that Wilford had given me their names that they had actually traveled to Texas with Dr. Lake back in 1927, and they were trained divine healing technicians. Now, are you all familiar with Dr. Lake's ministry? Everybody know pretty much about him? All right. Well, back from 1914 until 1920, he was in Spokane, Washington, and from 20 to 25, he was in Portland, Oregon. And I noticed coming in how much this looks. This area looks like Portland, Oregon. It is almost identical. And there's even an area here, what, Portland Park or Portland something or other? That's it, yeah. And I thought, there you go. So uh, it's amazing. It's amazing how much it looks alike. And the, that doesn't mean anything. You could have healing if it didn't. If it looked like a desert out here, you could still have healing. It doesn't matter. So you know, don't, don't get weird, all right? <laughs> so I'm telling you, you've got to put those out there all the time. <laughs> okay. The Spirit of God can work anywhere, anytime, under any conditions. All right? You don't have to get the conditions right for Him to work. All right? If your God only works when the conditions are right, you need a new God. All right? Mine works under storm conditions when everything is chaos and everything's going wrong. I don't have to have everything right for Him to show up. Amen? He's not a spoiled rock star that you know, doesn't work unless you have the right green M&Ms or whatever else it is that He wants. It doesn't work that way. All you have to have is sick people, and He will show up. Amen? Because he, he cares about them. So, all right, just want to throw that in there to so make sure you're not you know, flaking off on me anywhere. Now, all right. Then um, we went over and, I, and I, I talked to this lady. I found her in a nursing home. Uh, she was 90, I think 91 or so at that point, in 95. And she, was, uh, she had married the son of a divine healing technician. While Dr. Lake was in Spokane and in Portland, he began praying for people and started getting such results that the people that were coming were too, too numerous for him to pray for them. So he had to train people to pray for the sick. And what he trained them in was what he called the science of divine healing, which is simply going back to the Bible and doing what the Bible said. And as they started praying for people, 16 men and women prayed for 
actually prayed for quite a few, but during the five-year period in Spokane, they had 100,000 confirmed healings. Now, that's 20,000 a year that they were seeing on the average. Now, that was between all 16 people. Well, this woman had married the son of one of those 16 people. And so whenever Dr. Lake left Spokane or left Portland in 1925, he went down the West Coast, started some healing rooms down in Sacramento and San Diego. Then he went across to Texas and was in Houston, Texas. Houston, Texas, he had a great turnout. He had over a thousand people for his first church service. He started a church there and 800 of them were sick. And so they, he told him, he said, if you'll stay with me 30 days, you will be well. And he even reiterated a, a promise that he had made up in Portland and in Spokane that if anybody could sit under his teaching for 30 days and not be well or, trim, or noticeably improved, that he would give them $500. Now think about that. <clears throat> I mean, we think that the circumstances have to be perfect. To get everything, we got people trying to be healed. And he says, if you can try to not be healed, I'll give you $500. All right? That's how how convinced he was. We're going to talk about some of that as we go along. Because this gets pretty simple as you you get into it. So, he, um, while he was there, had pretty good results. His son was involved in an accident in uh, Spokane. And there was a woman there that had lost her mind. And they requested him to come pray for her. She'd been part of his congregation uh, back whenever he was there in 1920. And so he took a train, went back up to Spokane, and, and that was in uh, at 1927. Then he went traveling around some more. But in 1931, he resettled in Spokane. Now, whenever he left the church in Houston, there was a young man that had traveled from Oregon down to Houston with him that he left in charge of the church. Now, the young man only stayed there a short time, but later he went back to Oregon and married a woman named Frida, and he actually was Gordon Lindsay. And then later on, he started Christ of the Nations and moved back to Dallas area. So we have uh, records of Dr. Lake going through Dallas. Uh, F.F. Bosworth was in Dallas. And and I can't go into this too much, but I love Pentecostal history. Because I can tie all the people together. And it's amazing who ran together and who was with one another. Iron sharpens iron, right? Don't get around dull people, all right? Because they will dull you. Now, I understand there's people around you, but if you have your choice... Get around people that sharpen you, even if their sharpening isn't pleasant, right? But they will sharpen you. Get around people that help you, not people that pull you down. Now, you can minister to people that pull you down, but you don't fellowship with them, all right? You see them coming, have a little book, give it to them. Oh, you know, soon, how are things? Oh, it's bad. Oh, read this, <laughs> right? Send them off. The next time you see them, you ask them again, how are things going? No, I tell you, it's still bad. No, here, I got another book. Read that, right? And when you finally see them and you say, how are things going? They're going, man, I'll tell you what. I, I tell you, God is with... Oh, okay, now we can fellowship, all right? But get with people that sharpen you, all right? <clears throat> because who you hang around with, you will rise or fall to their level. Simple as that. And I'll just be real honest with you. More than likely, if you're ever going to go very far in God, you're going to spend some time walking alone, all right? Don't be afraid to walk alone, all right? That doesn't mean if you're a rebel... All right, I'm not talking to rebels, all right? <clears throat> but but don't, um, don't be surprised if you're called that, all right? It's good to rebel against the wrong, all right? But I'm telling you, the church is in for a revolution. It's heading that way, all right? A revolution between truth and religion. And there are people that like religion. They like the comfort of it. They like the status quo. Jesus was never status quo. He was a revolutionary. He caused trouble. He caused riots. He caused all kinds of things. And the religious world did not like him. All right? They killed him. And if they did it to him, they'll do it to you. If they're not doing it to you, the Bible says, Woe unto them whom all speak well of. Right? So if everybody's speaking real good of you, maybe you're not cutting edge into the spiritual area. Right? And I'm not talking about doing stupid things. You know, you ought to pay your bills on time. You ought to have a good reputation as, you know, in areas like that. <clears throat> but the people who ought to not like you is the religious people. You ought to be all over them. I, used, I told people I was up in Chalice, Idaho one time. I was ministering with, um, actually a couple of people, y'all probably know them. Uh, Chris Vallotton, David Hogan. Y'all know any of those? Yeah. Right? And uh, we were ministering up there. And I told them from the very beginning, I said, look down at your toes and say bye. 
because I plan to walk all over them the next couple of days. All right? So that's kind of kind of the way we operate. Um, we, we take these traditions. My, see, my job is really simple. I just take the traditions that man has built up, and we just destroy them. And when we get done, there's nothing left but the Word of God, and the Word of God works. And it re- so it's real simple. So uh, basically, if I bring up something, don't, don't say amen, because I'm probably fixing to kill it. Right? It's a sacred cow. And so if I talk about something, just stay quiet. And if you do it, nobody will know. Right? And just change. Okay? Um, like John Osteen used to say, John, not Joel, but John Osteen, he used to say, if I rub the cat the wrong way, let the cat turn around. That's kind of the way I feel. All right? So, anyway, all right. Now, after a couple of years, I went and found this lady and started talking to her. She was 91 years old at that time. And I asked her all the same questions I'd ask everybody else. Because if you ask the same questions to enough people, you start getting a few of the same answers, and you can tell that's the truth. And so when I, I started asking her all these questions, just basically wore her out, which didn't take long with a 91-year-old sometimes. And she was, um, you could tell she wasn't all that happy. And finally she just said, you know, all your questions would be answered if you just had the manual. And I said, well, yeah, but, you know, where can I find one of, the, one of those? And she said, well, I've got one. You know, and I almost did a Fred Sanford, you know. You know, we're like, you do? Well, can I, can I read it? She said, well, you can read it, you can see it, but you can't have it till I die. I said, okay, because she knew of my relationship with Wilfred and all. And so I said, okay, and so I got to go through it and make notes, and, but she wouldn't let go of it until she died. So it took me two years to pray her to death. <laughs> said, you know, <laughs> You know, Lord, she's been alive a long time. <laughs> she's past 80, Lord. She's, you know, she's lived a good life. <laughs> but it took about two years. But by the end of 97, we got in the manual. And I believe me, I had studied. I, I still have one of the largest personal libraries that most people have seen. And you can ask my son. He's helped move it a dozen times. And so, but... um. I've got pretty much every book ever written on healing, even the ones that are just pure garbage, which is about 98% of them. And so, but I still have them because I want to read what people are saying. And I, I had gone through these things, and I had, did, I, I, I had practiced everything that they said to do, and still was only getting about 15 to 25% success rate, which is still pretty good because the average Christian, the average church gets about 10% success. Maybe one out of 10 actually gets healed. And so, as I was studying these things, I was going through it all. I was doing everything by the book. But yet, on, uh, I had a daughter that was born in 1978. She was born with a hemangioma tumor. A hemangioma tumor is a tumor that's made of blood vessels. A bunch of blood vessels kind of in a lump. And when she was born, she had a tumor about the size of my fist that was made of these blood vessels. And what made it unusual was that this tumor, she was the only child, even to this day, that has ever been born with a tumor like this in her tongue. And so this tumor, about the size of my fist, it looked like a bag of snakes because you could see the blood vessels inside and whenever the heart pumped, it, they would move. And so it was a, a deep purple because of all the blood. The tongue was very thin. The skin was thin. And so when she was born, we were shocked. There was no warning about it. They, it, was, it was not there. Before she was born. I mean, literally, they, they did sonograms. They did the whole bit. Everything was fine. But the, the minute she was born, it was there. And so when she was delivered, her tongue was out of her mouth. Uh, she could not pull it back into her mouth. It was something very horrible to look at. Uh, she was our daughter. We loved her, of course. But still, for the average person, it was very horrible. Uh, my, <clears throat> my wife's grandmother actually made a bonnet for her that had little snaps that... Could, had this thing to put her tongue in so that we could take her out in public and people wouldn't stare as much, even though they still did. Uh, but we'd be pushing her through the mall and she had, I mean, it bothered her. And she would pull this thing off and we could tell when she did because of how people reacted. Uh, people would, well, people can be pretty cruel, to be honest with you. And so we uh, had to keep it moist, had to keep it wet. If it dried out, it would crack, it would bleed. Uh, the doctors told us when she was born that we would never live be able to live more than five minutes from a hospital because if she cut her tongue, she would bleed to death in less than five minutes. Uh, we lived a little ways out in the country. Several times as she was growing older, they told us that she would never, that if she did grow teeth, that they didn't think she would, but if she did, that uh, it would cut into the tongue and she would bleed to death. There were several times we would wake up in the morning and there would be blood all over the room. 
literally, where she had cut it and it would just spew blood. <clears throat> and so it looked like someone, I, I didn't know a person could bleed that much, to be honest with you, and still live. And we would grab her up, put a, a towel or something on her mouth, on her tongue, and pray in tongues all the way to the hospital. And about three different times we did that. When we got her there, you could see where the, it looked like a scar. And every time she was healed before we got there, but, and, and the tumor was actually going down, but we never were able to get it gone. And so whenever she turned three, a little after three, she had developed double pneumonia. And <clears throat> within a matter of days, just like, well, actually it was like two days, uh, we called the doctor that night, told what was going on, and he said, she'll be okay, keep her cool, keep her wet, and uh, she'll be okay, but bring her in in the morning. Well, in the morning, she was dead. And so I got on the phone and called every major ministry. If I named them, you'd know them. And many of them that are known for healing. Uh, you have to remember this was in 1981 when she passed away. So there are some ministries now that are prominent that were not at that time. <clears throat> and we called everybody that we could. And most of them I couldn't even get on the phone. Saying she died on Friday the 13th in 1980, February 1981. We buried her the next day. The reason we buried her so quick is because they didn't know what that tumor was going to do and how it was going to look in a day or two, so we had to bury her quickly. And so the next day, which was Valentine's Day, we buried her in McKinney, Texas, which is just, just north of Dallas. matter of fact, it's where Kenneth Hagin came from, if you all remember, if you didn't know anything about him. Um, so we buried her out there, and whenever I stood at that cemetery and watched this little white casket go down into the ground, I stood there and made a vow to God. And I said, God, there was no man for me when I needed one. But if you will teach me, I will be that man for somebody else. And so from that day, I started going after healing. And whenever I got a hold of the manual from the woman in 97, I started going through it, and it was amazing. It totally destroyed everything I had learned. Everything. And remember, I had learned the best from the best at the time. But I realized that every condition they put on healing was wrong. Everything about it was wrong. The way it was practiced was wrong. The, 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 even the premise was wrong. And so I started immediately. I, <clears throat> I made a decision right then that I would totally disregard everything I'd ever learned and start from scratch. And so I started studying what Dr. Lake had put together. And uh, immediately, I mean, just the first thing I did was change how I prayed. Instead of talking to God about the healing, I told the sickness or disease what to do. Instead of, there's not one place in the Bible, in the New Testament especially, where it ever tells us to talk to God about a healing. Not one. Now, the main thing, like I said, you're going to give the next three days is a good dose of responsibility. That you're going to find out that you are to be, according to God, a mix between a soldier and a policeman in the spiritual realm. Now, in times past, we've looked at that, and we've thought, okay, I can be a policeman, and we thought our job was to tell other humans, as God's policemen, where they were committing crimes against God. And to a degree, there's a truth in that. People need to, to know what sin is and how to get out of it. But more than that, as a policeman, the criminals against God is sickness, sin, disease, demonic beings, anything that would exalt itself against the knowledge of God. Our job is to search them out and destroy them. Not to coddle them and not to placate people who perpetuate them. Our job is to destroy them. Simply just state the truth. And so that's what we started doing. I started changing the way I prayed and, and just started commanding instead of asking. And immediately our success rate shot up. And then over a period of time, as I continued studying the manual and continued making changes, the main changes I made after initially changing how I prayed was in what I believed. Because essentially what, what it comes down to is what you get is what you're believing when you pray. And so if you're, pray, if you're believing for a progressive healing, that's probably what you're going to get. If you're believing for an instant healing, that's probably what you're going to get. But... The other aspect was I quit looking at other people's faith. And I decided, not decided, found, decided to walk according to it, but I found that even though Jesus would acknowledge people's faith, he never relied on it. And when people didn't have faith, 
He had it for them. And one of the ways I discovered that was there was a man that came to Dr. Lake. <clears throat> came into his office one day. And Dr. Lake was sitting at his desk. And the man came in on crutches. And he walked in and he said, uh, actually, I'll tell you the, kind of the whole story. When he came in, the man said, I'm a good Catholic. And I don't want anything that's going to hurt my religion. And he said, I don't have faith in man. I don't have faith in doctors. I don't even have faith in God for healing, obviously. And he said, what can you do for me? Now, most people, most Christians would have said, not a thing. You've got to have faith if you're going to be healed, because that's the general teaching. But Dr. Lake wasn't that way. He laughed. He pushed himself back from his desk and said, that's all right. I've got enough faith for both of us. And he got up and walked over next to the man that had the crutch. And he stood there and talked with him. And he said, this is, this is the point he wanted to bring out as he was relaying this story. He said, I never prayed for the man. He said, I let the spirit of life flow from me to him to drive out the sickness and disease. And while he stood there talking to the man, he eventually was shaking the man's hand. He eventually, while he was talking to him, took the man's crutch away from him. The man didn't even notice he had taken his crutch. Was standing there talking to him, holding him by the arm, shook his arm when he got done and said, well, you go and have a good day. And the man turned and walked out without his crutch and didn't even notice that he was healed. (laughs) When he got outside in the hallway, Lake called to him and said, Hey, do you want this? Now, this is I'm repeating what the man said, so we'll find out how religious you are. Because if you rear up, it'll be because you're religious. And so the the man turned back to back to Lake and looked at him and said, looked at the crutch and said, Ah to hell with it. (laughs) That's what he said. And Lake said, I agree. And so he put the crutch down. The man walked out healed. Now, honestly, that's probably the most accurate use of that word that you can make because that's where it came from. Sickness and disease is not from God. It's not sent to teach you anything, to show you anything. It's not meant to make you better. It is meant to destroy you. See, I'm just going to give you a break here in about less than a minute, two minutes at, at the most. Most doctors are closer to the heart of God than most Christians. Because their job, they know their whole job is to eradicate sickness and disease. Most Christians believe that it's somehow we're supposed to coddle it, that it's somehow God is using it for our benefit, to teach us something, to make us better. It doesn't make you better. All it does is show you what's there. Hardship and trials do not make you better. They just reveal what's in there. Now... When you're, when you're pressed, what's in is what's going to come out. Right? Now, no army has ever brought glory to its king or its commander by showing how much it could suffer at the hands of an enemy army. They bring glory by conquering enemy armies. Our job is to conquer, not to show God how much we can suffer sickness or disease and put up with it. Now, your hardship, your suffering, is not sickness and disease. Your hardship and suffering are the things that you choose to go through for the propagation of the gospel. See, Paul gave a good example in Corinthians when he said, I've been shipwrecked, I've been in the water, I've, had, I've been in peril of brethren, false brethren, I've been in peril of robbers. He said, in, we've been in fastings, we have been whipped, we've been beaten, all these things. He gave that as, the, as his credentials for being an apostle and a minister of God. He didn't say, look at my new car, how God's blessing me. Look at my new house, look at my new jet ski. He didn't say that. Matter of fact, I tell people a lot of times, if you, people, well, you know, I'm believing God for a new jet ski. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, that's why Jesus gave you your faith, and I hope you can use it on a lake of fire, because that's probably where it's going to take you. <laughs> so, I don't, I don't, I don't, my, my recreation is either reading the Word of God or healing the sick. That is recreation. People say, what do, you, what do you do for a vacation? That is my vacation. That's what I do. I don't take vacation. But you know why I don't take vacations? Because sickness and disease doesn't. Amen. Most Christians, every Christmas, people want to cut off two weeks. And spend two weeks doing decorations and all the little good little things. And during those two weeks, cancer is still eating people's body. And you're two weeks behind when you come back on after January 1st and decide you want to get serious with God again. 
and now that person's more dead. Now this may see the one thing you're going to realize is that this is not another healing seminar. This is life and death. People will live or die based on what you get out of this class. What you will learn, and once you really truly understand that who you touch will live and who you don't touch will probably die, then you'll start to look at your hands different. And you won't be talking about an anointing. You'll be talking about, God, show me how I can be more usable. Show me the things, that, the weights, the little sins that get in the way. Show me those things so I can get rid of them, so I can run my race clearer and faster, and show me what's important. Because I'm telling you, all the little gimmicks that the church has today is not going to last. Because it lasts for the next fad. You know, the next thing, people talk about one thing after another. And basically everybody thinks that, you know, the new book, whatever new book is coming out. And I tell people all the time, most of the church is not led by the Spirit of God, they're led by the book publishers. And whatever book comes out, that's the fad that the church jumps on, and then they run with it until the next fad. And I'm telling you, if that if that's what you think healing is, you're wasting my time and you're wasting your time. Because this is life or death. This isn't a fad, it's not neat, it's not magic, it's not snap your fingers and you know, all the glory and your name and lights and all that kind of stuff. It's getting awakened at 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning from a phone call where the first 10 minutes you're trying to calm somebody down because they're screaming and crying because their baby's dead or dying. And see, I, in the last, what, 10 years, I guess, I've probably had less than 30 days of sleep all the way through. My phone is on 24-7. My phone number, my cell phone number is on my website. Actually, the number's not, but if you go to our 800 number, it says if it's an emergency, you push a button, it comes to my phone. That was another thing that I decided from early on, that my, my phone would not be enlisted. That if people, I was never going to stay, go to, to a meeting and somebody said, uh, I got a grave because I couldn't get through to you. Because I know what it's like. I've been there. And I decided I would always be accessible. During the breaks, I'm not going to run off and hide. I don't have to go, you know, re-energize or... You know, protect the anointing because you're going to drag me down. That ain't that isn't the way it works, right? Matter of fact, being around you, I get built up. The more I talk about the Word of God, the more powerful I get. The more I'm around you, the more questions you ask, the more the more powerful I get. I don't wear out. If I did, I'd rather wear out than rust out. Amen. Amen. And so I'm, that's I, I, I sat in meetings like this, and I kept thinking, boy, if I could just get to him for five minutes and ask just two questions. That would shoot me down the road a lot faster. And I, when I sat in these meetings, I made a vow to God. God, if I'm ever in that position, I'll be available. Where people can ask me questions and I can run and hide. You know, there are times whenever I, somebody, I need to pray for somebody or I get a phone call or something where I do need to separate. But overall, I'm here. And you want to talk, we can talk. You want a fellowship, I love fellowship. I don't get enough of it. I'm always on the road, so I don't get enough. But I want you to know that this is going to be totally different from probably most of what you've ever heard or, or been around. So, but this is real life. Amen? Because what we do, if it's Bible, it has to work everywhere. If it won't work everywhere, it's not gospel. Right? Most of what the church practices in America for healing will not work in India, where in the church today you have to go in and find everybody's past sin. You know, where did the devil get a door in? How did you get into this? Let's go back and find the history of this thing. Let's find the root of your generational curse. Let me kill this one right away. Just real, I know I told you two minutes. Okay. I repent. I lied. Okay. okay. I'm trying. But let me tell you, if you're a Christian, generational curses do not apply to you. You don't have a generation. Your generation goes back one generation to Jesus Christ. Isn't that right? Every problem every Christian has goes back to this. One of two things. They either do not know the benefits of the covenant they have, or they're not walking in the benefits of the new birth. That's it. Everything goes back to that. Because my father was an alcoholic. My earthly father. I, obviously, not my heavenly father. But my, my earthly father. <laughs> my earthly father. And he drank heavily when I was a child. He was a police officer. He saw a lot of things. He drank heavily. And I saw what it would do. And when I was nine years old, I made a vow to God that I would never touch alcohol. I have never have. I've never smoked a cigarette. I've never done drugs. Now, every other sin I have done. So, right? so I, it wasn't that I was a goody-goody. You know, it wasn't that. It's just I made vows to God and I didn't break them. Now, 
according to generational curse teaching, I'm an only child. There is nowhere else for that curse to go. Right? It was supposed to come to me, but I've never touched it. But my generation goes back to Jesus. Right? And there's no generational curses that come from him. He became a curse for me. Right? That I might receive the blessings. So I got generational blessings, not generational curses. I've, see, you can't go to India and try to pull out that generational curse thing. And first off, if you went with me, you'd be there. You'd have to become a missionary. You have a crowd of 50,000 people and you're going to go back. Their whole generation all the way back is cursed. Right? They've served false gods and idols and everything else. It's all the way back. And yet, you go there, you, you don't have time to go into these people's lives. You gotta, you're not told to. Paul said, forget the past. Move forward. Press on. See, our job is to set the captives free, not to point out their faults. And we're not to be their judges. We're to be their deliverers. This gets real simple. Just be a soldier. Soldiers don't decide who gets to be free and who doesn't. Oh, you deserve freedom. You don't. Every, see, none of us deserve freedom. But because of Jesus, we all deserve it. Isn't that right? So everything is warfare. Everything go, see, this is real simple. Everything goes back to this. The devil is defeated. Now find his works that are still in operation and destroy them. Kill them, cast them out, defeat them, whatever it takes. But it's real simple. Now, the problem is, you have to get rid of all those stupid beliefs that says, yeah, but what about? Yeah, but what if? And I always tell people, you know, the, the one statement I hear more than any other is, yeah, but. And I tell them, I am here to kick your butts. <laughs> all right? Right out the door. Because butts don't count. All right? But, we'll get into this a little, little bit later on, but I'm telling you, there is not one thing that can stop the power of God. If a sin can stop the power of God, you didn't get saved. Because you were in sin. And the power of God delivered you. And they right? And you didn't know squat about the Bible, most of you, when you got saved. You beat the devil with one scripture, John 3.16. And once you get saved, now you think you've got to know all of theology before you can beat the devil. One little imp of spirit of infirmity or, or some type of sickness or disease, you think you have to have perfect theology. And I'm here to tell you, all you have to have is perfect determination that you, you won't give up before they do. And once you get that grit, it works. And most of the time, once you get that grit, they leave before you get there. I'm telling you, they don't want to tie in with that. Why? Because they ain't got the time. It's easier to go somewhere else where a Christian will go, Oh yeah, this is my thorn. You know, this is the cross i got to bear. No, Jesus bore that cross. Okay? Your cross is people. All right? Just believe it. If you're in the ministry, you know I'm telling you the truth. All right? Your cross to bear is people. All right? So, we'll see. All right. Let me give you a break. Let's take a break real quick, about 10 minutes.